Hello, welcome to the Parenting Program Show. I am your host, Jeremy, the Kung Fu Guy. I am a force of nature married to another force of nature. Her name is Autumn. And we have two amazing explosive balls of energy called kids. I am a speaker, teacher, author, catalyst, and Kung Fu master here to help you empower your kids to speak up and own their voice. We're going to unlock and remove the chains of childhood that seem to hold us from our destiny with the tools to have inner strength, confidence to speak up, be heard, and be understood. Let's go play. Game on, yo. Hello and welcome to the Parenting Program Podcast. I am your host, Jeremy Rodruck, the Kung Fu Guy, and I am super excited to be getting this going with you guys today. We're going to be covering some really important strategies a little bit later on how to connect with your kids and how to start improving your communication really in just three very, very simple, very easy steps. And I'm super excited to be sharing this podcast with you because it, it it really is about, you know, as parents, nobody gave us the owner's manual. No one gave us a user's guide. It's a lot of trial by error. It's a lot of fly by the city of your pants. And it's a lot of, here's what your parents did and it worked or it didn't and you liked it or you didn't. And so you're pushing and pulling and changing and we've all had that moment under stress when we start channeling our parents and we start saying the things we know, we swore we would never say. And yet here we are, wonk, 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 in the back of our head, we're saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. Well, we're going to help change that conversation. And here's why you guys should listen, right? You don't have to be a perfect parent. You don't have to have all of the answers. We weren't taught these skills. We weren't taught how to communicate and how kids develop and all the different milestones and how the situation and the sequence can get messed up. We weren't given any of that stuff. But what you're going to get here is you're going to get support, you're going to get tools to empower yourself, and more importantly, empower your kids so they can speak up, they can own their own voice. And how do you create that with them? How do you help them to say what's really on their mind, what's really in their heart, in a way that they're going to be heard, they're going to be understood, without creating a lot of conflict, without creating a lot of crashing energy. And this really has been kind of a lifelong obsession from me because it even from the beginning of when I was born, it was a struggle, right? And so today I'm going to share a little bit about my own personal journey and why serving families and kids is such an important thing to me. And I didn't know it at the time. I actually found out about eight years old. But when I was born, turns out I'm two, one of two, my brother older than me, he made it. Uh, But my mom had 10 pregnancies. And out of those 10, only two of us lived. And When I found out, I was not in a great place in my life and and who I was eight years old and I already had some pretty significant issues going on, but I felt massive guilt because I found out, wait, I hate me and I hate my life, but I have eight siblings who didn't make it. And I suddenly felt this responsibility, like I have to live, company's joining us, excuse me. This is Miss CP. She's our outside inside cat. And she may want to check things out. We also have a, a blind cat, Merlin. He always wants to see what's going on. And uh, yeah, so he, you may have them jump through. It's no big deal. But I felt guilty because I'm not happy and I have four four siblings. I should be living for them. And I felt like this sense of responsibility. Now, why did I have those issues? We got to back the story up just a little bit. So obviously I was born, you know, that's where things started. And then um, I was a military family, right? And my dad was in the Air Force, we traveled a bunch. So we lived in Turkey, we lived in Saudi Arabia when I was a kid, we visited Spain, we visited Greece, we visited Germany, uh, Thailand, we went to uh, briefly through Hong Kong. Before I was in second grade, I had been in more countries than most people go to states before they graduate high school. So I was this high energy kid. I was raised on a leash because I would run into traffic. Um, In fact, there's actually twice that I got pulled out of the street because I would have been dead. So there's my mom on the side of the road holding onto me and I'm four years old squirming trying to get loose because I want to see, well, you're boring and what's going on over there? Actually, when I was four, I got lost in a Turkish bazaar for 45 minutes, uh, almost an hour. It's like my parents are panicked and the Turks are putting word through the bazaar. Hey, look for an American couple missing a white kid. Um, and I got extra white. So I was just a high energy guy, four years old, climbed on the roof of the house, looking over, had to tell my eight year old brother how to come get me because I was crazy. I was just so high energy and just so all over the place. But unfortunately, a lot of that positive energy that I had when I was in Turkey, it changed when I was in Saudi. 
And when I was about five years old, I was out playing in a place I shouldn't have been. I went out past the, the security gate. We lived in the military compound. And I ended up being abused by a security guard. And then we came back to the States. And when I was six, a year later, I actually was abused by a couple of kids up the street. And that does things. See, I didn't blame the other people because little kids don't know how to disassociate. They don't know how to separate. I am bad versus I did something bad. That, that requires the ability to disassociate our behavior. And so the abuse, there was a part of me that said it was my fault. I deserved this. I didn't follow the rules. I went out where I wasn't supposed to. And I didn't make the situation wrong. I made me wrong. And unconsciously, I buried the memories, but I just lived in this place of survival for pretty much my whole life, like 20 something years, constantly in a place of life and death. You ever play tic-tac-toe with a seven-year-old who believes that if they lose, they're going to die? It brings a huge level of intensity. And what that did for me is it made me just realize I'm a freak. I got so much energy. And then you add that survival instinct on top of it. I had to back up. I had to like watch what is going on, who are these people, how are things being done, because I'm too much. I have too much energy for a given situation and I scare people. So I pulled back and I had to hide who I was and I had to study other people and figure out the situation. So think of it kind of like I was a, a skittish cat where I'm just, I don't know who to trust, I don't know where I trust and where's safety. Never sat with my back to a door. I always saw all the entrances and exits. I always knew my environment. And that's how I kind of grew up from second grade to fifth grade. But it wasn't all, you know, darkness and dark clouds and goth music. It was a lot of the good times, too. And there was a lot of good fun. My parents gave me a lot of unconditional love and they really did their best to, to love me and to help me. And one of the benefits of all that travel in second grade, we got into a new school system. I didn't have to make friends because I had teachers who would introduce me to everybody. I didn't have to do anything. It was like, oh, well, isn't that helpful? problem. When my dad retired from the Air Force and then in sixth grade I moved to a new school system, I don't know how to make friends. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to introduce myself. So now I get even more pulled back. And going into middle school, I had this idea of myself, who I was, because in second through fifth grade, I was super popular, knew everybody, everybody knew me. And then in sixth grade, things got shaky because I, I really didn't have that anymore. And I didn't really know who I was or where I fit in. Seventh grade, where I went to school, five different elementary schools came together into one middle school. And so I saw people I had known for like four or five years. I was like, oh, hey, guys. And, you know, people didn't quite remember me. Or I remember one key thing is uh, homeroom. This girl sitting in front of me, I introduced myself, say, hi, I'm Jeremy, and I forget what her name is. And I was like, blah, blah, blah. She's like, oh, I think I've heard that name before. I'm like, yeah, well, I used to go to this school, and then I, I left for a year and went to that school, and now I'm back here. And she says, oh, that's right. You're that a-hole that everyone was talking about. And I went, what? And inside me, something broke. Something changed. And I felt it because this idea who I had from second to fifth grade, got a little shaky in sixth grade, was now validated in seventh grade. I didn't question her or her opinion and say, well, maybe you have the wrong guy or are you just kidding? I took her 100% to heart and it hurt. It hurt bad. And that began to set a time period in my life where I began to float because I didn't know who I was. I had this anger. I had this fear. I had this need to control. It was a horrible place to live. At the same time, I swam from 8 to 13 and the last two years 11 to 13 I don't want to swim anymore I want off the team my parents and I are fighting over it and it got to the point when I finally convinced them I definitely want to quit swimming in eighth grade uh, yeah eighth grade I quit the family because it had been such a caustic experience trying to stop the swimming I'm 13 years old, I don't wanna to talk to my parents anymore. I only told them what I felt I needed them to know so that I could get what I wanted. And that's not a great place to live. And so from about 13 to about 26, still very defensive, still very manipulative, kept a lot of stuff back from them. And then when I went into high school, things got difficult. Now, I had a group of friends, I had, I was like, 13 of us. We called ourselves the wimpy kids from the suburbs, the WKFTS, or the white kids from the suburbs, whatever. And 
you know, I had a great group of people to run around and at the same time I felt distant from them I felt separated from them I felt like I didn't matter I felt like I didn't belong I felt like no one cared and I had that reinforced because my junior year I got mono and I got sick and my brother had to shame my friends into coming and visiting me because no one had visited me my best friend was dropping off my homework and then he would leave so here I am for weeks at a time, literally by myself and my family, and that's it. And I was lonely. But it gave me time to think. And that was really the wake-up call for me is like, dude, you're a jerk. Like, you're manipulative. You're this, you're that. And I really began to look at my behavior and go, why aren't they visiting me? And those questions began to change how I viewed myself and how I operated. And so when I came back my senior year, I almost didn't graduate because I only needed one credit to graduate, which was newspaper. I needed one English credit my senior year. I had everything else. But I don't want to write to deadline, and I don't want to write about things I don't want to write about. And because I'm going to be stubborn, my parents offered to buy me a car if I made honor roll. I got five A's and one F. Guess what the F was in? Ding, ding, ding. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Newspaper, yeah, yeah. I had to go to the teacher at the end of the year and literally beg for a special project just so I could get a D, just so I could graduate, which you know pulled my GPA down, everything. So I could have done a lot better in school, but I just wanted to be out of there. I hated being controlled. I hated being told what to do. I'd always had problems with authority. I'd always had problems with, you know, risky behavior. <clears throat> in my experience, actually, risky behavior is not risky behavior. It's adult behavior in pre-adult people, right? I quit smoking when I was nine. I also decided against taking holy orders to become a Franciscan monk because I'm going to go and be a dad because that was something really meaningful to me. I wanted to, this idea of being a spiritual father, but how can you be a spiritual father if you're not a biological father first? And so at nine, I decided I wanted to be a dad. I quit smoking and it's a weird place to be. By 12, I was doing cross-cultural religious studies because I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know what to trust. So I had to do it all myself is what I felt like. I didn't know who I could talk to. And really that's, that's what led me into college and it led me into a space where I could start to become more free and more open. My grade point in school and college, no studying, I had a 3.6 because college worked for me. I clicked so much better, but my parents had a rule. Either you're in college or you're working, you're not going to stay here for free. And so when I first started, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college. So I didn't start and immediately I went and worked in a sandpaper factory and then by the time I figured out what I wanted, my parents wouldn't pay for it. Nerds. So that complicated things, but I ended up going to college for about a year and a half. While I was working in the sandpaper factory, I also started Kung Fu. And that was the second major milestone in my life. The first one, obviously, is the abuse. The second one really was starting Kung Fu because that's where everything literally began to turn. I remember it was May of 95, and we had had my teacher's teacher. So my teacher is Grandmaster Benny Ming. He's my Sifu. Chinese term means teacher and father. I'm a Sifu. It's pretty awesome. But the next level up, my grandfather in martial arts, my Sigong, is Moyat, um, one of my Sigongs. So Grandmaster Moyat, he came to do a workshop in Dayton, Ohio. I couldn't make the workshop because factory work. But I could come out and hang out at nighttime. And we have a special way we teach in our Kung Fu family. It's called Kung Fu Life. Because... What we do on the training floor should translate into how we live our lives, right? This idea of asserting boundaries, respecting boundaries, understanding timing, understanding distance, understanding cause and effect, all these things that happen in, in combat, in, in interaction with another person, also happens in life. Life is just kind of a slower process. And it became a really great way for me to get into physical, mental, emotional, linking myself together and really figuring out what was going on. So Grandmaster Ming, we're, having, we're playing pool. And he heard me say something to myself about myself out loud that was negative. It was derogatory. It was destructive. And he stopped what he was doing. And he looked at me in the eye. And he said, don't talk to yourself like that. And he held it for a second. And then he went back to playing pool. We talked about this a few years ago. And he's like, really? I said that? I'm a smart guy. I was like, yeah, absolutely you did, sir. And... The way he said it, how he said it, who he was, how I represented him in my life, I know my parents had told me the same things. But it didn't land on me the way that it did when he said it. And because I worked in the factory, I had a lot of time to think. 
And I realized just how angry I was about everything all the time. Anger woke me up. It got me fed. It put me to bed. It's how I cooked. It's how I cleaned. It's how I did everything. And I really began to start going into that conversation going, well, how am I talking to myself? In my head, but out loud, everything. And I began to unpack what was going on. And I went, wow, I'm a jerk to me. Forget about anybody else. How can I do anything genuine for them if I'm constantly tearing myself down? In fact, one of my, my best Kung Fu brothers, Master Chango, when, when we first met, I didn't know it at the time. He'd been studying since he was five, and he's five years older than me. He had already almost 20 years of martial arts experience. But he went to shake my hand and say, hi, I'm Chango. And I was like, oh, I don't shake hands. He was like, oh, why is that? And I said, because shaking hands in ancient warrior cultures is a representation. You're not carrying a weapon, but you're a martial artist. You've trained your whole body to be a weapon, so that makes you a liar, and I don't believe in lying. And he was like, oh... And so in his head, in his heart, he's like, you son of a... Mm. And he prayed that I would last long enough to make it to sparring because he was going to wipe the walls with me. And I did. And he did. He beat the crap out of me. And it wasn't any fun because every time he would knock me down, hit me, punch me, kick me, whatever, I would get up and go, that was cool. How'd you do it? And I'd come back and like, do it again. And I was like this insatiable little puppy that no matter what you do, I keep coming and keep coming. It's like, oh my gosh, stop yourself. And he realized over time, I wasn't the jerk that I presented myself as. That was actually a defense mechanism because I knew inside, I believed that I was worthless. And since I was worthless, I knew you were going to reject me. And I didn't know when. So what I was going to do is I would engineer things to make you reject me on my terms so that I'm in control. That's the pattern I was running because I was scared because... Here I am, this scrawny white kid from the suburbs who has a very decent set of intellectual firepower who's constantly on the defense, and the only way he feels he can add value is by showing people how smart he is. Look at all the things he can do. I was in such a place that I needed approval that I kept driving and pushing and forcing situations. Now, think about your own life. Think about your own kids. When do they get scared, get insecure, and they actually push against the thing they really need. They need acknowledgement. They need to be heard. They need to be understood. They need to be appreciated. They need to be recognized for the good stuff they're doing, even when they drive you crazy, even when they're not paying attention. See, when we start to give people the things they need, it flows back so much easier versus trying to force compliance and force the structure, force the relationship. Does that make sense? By the way, my students have made a drinking game out of me saying, makes sense, because evidently I do that a lot. It's a language pattern I have. So it's the idea of being able to give your kids what they need that's such an important thing. And that's how my life began to change. I began to unpack. And so by 26, I realized I'm the first me my parents ever raised. The next time they do it, they'll do it right. They'll do it better. And I realized how much I didn't share of my own thoughts and my own life and my own experience. So how could they lead? How could they help? But I never told them there was a problem. So it, martial arts began to help me change my communication, began to change my self-confidence, right? I became a Pan American champion. I became a national champion multiple times, multiple grand champions at various tournaments. I've been featured on DVDs. I've written uh, articles for nationally published magazines. I've presented workshops in other countries. Kung Fu master, national champion. But for me right now in my life, the most important thing really is being a husband and being a father. It is the culmination of literally a lifelong dream. And I love being a dad. And I love being a husband. It's where I get my greatest joy. And then I see other families, other fathers, other parents, they struggle. And I see the kids in pain. I see the kids in fear. And there's tools, there's strategies. When I was in the martial arts school, when I first started assisting with classes, I worked really well with those kids that had the walls, that had that distance. Because I didn't come in from position saying, you have to listen to me because I'm the adult. I came in from a different place and I communicated a little bit different and it caught their attention. And it still catches people's attention. It still catches my students. And it allows me to begin to Im impact them in a different way. I can do a workshop. I can do a birthday party. And I can have a bunch of teenagers in the room. And within less than an hour, they're cleaning my martial arts school. And they don't know me from Adam. And the parents are looking at me like... How'd you, what the, how'd you? And I'm like, different language. It's a, it's a script. I actually have it in my book. 
uh, I think it's chapter six. I wrote down the specific script on how to get kids to clean their rooms and, and be excited about it because it's just a process. So my happy ending, daughter, stepson, they're rocking and rolling, and I have a best-selling book. I coach families and kids. I consult. I'm happier than I've ever been, and I'm at peace with my past. And I see the gifts, and I've unlocked the lessons. And I'm not saying that abuse in your past or anybody's past, I'm not saying that's a gift. I am not saying that. I'm saying that in my situation, I chose this particular story and this particular path. And... What I went through, I've, I've unlocked a lot of it and no one else needs to go through it. And I'm going to do everything I can to help empower the kids of this world, even the kid inside you as an adult. That little kid inside you that wasn't heard, acknowledged, wasn't loved the way you needed. We're going to help give that child a voice to be heard, to be seen, felt, heard, understand, and acknowledged. I'm on a mission to empower kids to speak up and own their voice. And we're going to work on how to create more power and more partnering in your relationships. How do you create win-win dynamics with yourself, with your family, with your customers, your clients, your boss, your employees, your employer, whatever your situation, you're dealing with human beings. Human beings do two things. They play games and they tell stories. And so this is an important topic. And getting into now some of the, the teaching tools and teaching tactics and strategies, it's important because kids today, all the trouble we're having in the world, kids today don't feel seen, they don't feel heard, they don't feel understood. And when you push them into a corner or when they felt feel like they're being pushed in a corner, they're gonna fight back. When we push people down and make them wrong and say, you can't do this, you can't think this, you can't want that, you can't, you can't, you can't, we put all this pressure in. What happens is we increase the pressure, it's gonna squirt out sideways and it becomes explosive. They damage and destroy themselves they damage and destroy other people, or they do horrible, horrible things. Why do we have school shootings? Why do we have teen suicide on the rise? It's because people are under so much pressure and they don't understand how to make it different. And I see families with so much love and they're just missing some communication tools. They're just, the gearing's off a little bit. And if the gears are aligned, everything goes together smooth. If the gears are misaligned, you're gonna get conflict. And that's how things break apart. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, 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 this is all well and good, but you know, in my day, kids were seen, not heard. And that's true, and you can have that attitude. The danger, though, is kids have more freedom than they've ever had. And at 18, your kids can leave, and you can enjoy looking at the back of their head as they never come back into your life. Because we have that ability now. Kids have that ability. When they become adults at 18, they're no longer kids. They can just leave your life. So you can be in that place, I, we call it positional authority, and you can be, I'm right, listen to me, and they bounce out because they have that freedom. And you might be thinking, yeah, but my kids are young, and they really don't know what they're saying. They don't really mean what they're saying. And what I'll tell you there is the words may be messy, but their heart always speaks the truth. Even if they don't know the right words to get across, we as adults, we need to stop and we need to listen. We need to figure out what is their heart communicating versus getting stuck on the structure of their words. And the other part you might be thinking is just, well, I'm the adult, I'm in charge, I know better, and they can't tell me what to do. And I agree with you. They can't tell you what to do. You are the boss. You are the parent. You are the final line in their growth. I absolutely agree with that, and I totally support that. And... I know there's ways to adjust your communication. So what I would offer with you is the idea that what if, instead of you being the teacher, instead of you being the boss, what if you were the guardian and you were the guide? What if you were gonna help guard your kids from danger and you were gonna guide them through various experiences? Because then it allows you to be a little more open, a little more curious. When you go on a tour, the guide doesn't tell you, this is important, this is why you will like it. They say, notice this thing and this is the history. They allow the people on the tour to have their own experience. So we can ram things down our kids' throats or we can help guide them. So you can be a guide and let your kids be your teacher. And how interesting would that be? You're still the fundamental law when it comes to the house. You are still the boss but you allow more what we call open frame. You allow more room to freedom to explore because at 18, you want them to move out and have their own life, right? You don't want them to move back in and be a 20 ager or a third ager or a four ager and living in your basement, right? Okay, just check it. So guardian and guide help them to see and understand. Now we come to some tips. And 
Here's what I'm gonna start with. If you would do this, take your right hand and make a fist and take your left hand and make a palm and put them one on top of the other, the palm on top of the fist. This is the bow that we use in our system. It's called Shaolin Wing Chun and it comes from China and it's a very old system. But the idea of this, the right hand making a fist, this is the tiger. It represents the visible world. It represents what you can see. It, ex it represents what you can directly experience. And the, the other hand, the palm, this represents the dragon. This represents wisdom. It represents the invisible that often controls the visible. And so we put these together because the mind controls the body. The dragon leads the tiger. We need both sides. Be active, but be smart, both. In the old days, we would say warrior and scholar. Today, we would say athlete and scholar, right? But it's the idea which is more important, the body or the mind. Yes, having both is a good thing. But for our purposes in the parenting program, the fist represents the behavior. It represents the games that people play. It's how we get energy. It's how we exchange energy. And then the hand, the dragon, that represents the stories we tell. Because the stories we tell are the justification for our behavior. The stories guide the games. So start paying attention to the stories your kids are telling you. I can't. That's too hard. I don't feel like it. Those are all stories. I didn't ask if you felt like it, I asked you to do it. It's that simple. So we wanna start paying attention to the games they're playing and the stories and how are we feeding energy? How are we giving them energy, right? And that's the second piece to this, is I have the games and I have the stories, but then I wanna start paying attention to what am I reinforcing? What do I get excited about, right? Why do two-year-olds run away from mom and dad? Because if you get up and you run away from mom and dad, mom and dad chase you. And you get more energy from the chase me game than I do from the stand still and listen game. So if I want my two-year-old to stay close to me, I just feed them more energy for staying close to me. Are you still there? Oh my gosh, you are doing such a good job listening. High five. And then I go and do my little shopping a little bit. And, oh my gosh, you're still right near me and you're doing a good job listening? I'm so proud of you. Can you give me some knuckle love? And I do that for you know every 15, 20, 30 seconds. But I just acknowledge them and say, hey, wow, I love how close you are. Could you hand me this? Could you hand me that? Oh, here. Could you put this in the thing? Oh, you can't stand. Oh, here. Let me pick you up. And then because I'm engaging them with energy and they get energy for staying close. So I'm feeding that. The other thing to watch is when your kids are upset and they drop down. This is called being kyphotic, by the way, when you round your back super bad and push your, push your spine out. So they're sitting there like this and they play the poor me game. If you go and touch them or give them a lot of energy, they might link up by me being a victim. I get energy. I get attention. So if they need your attention, I am so this and that and it's such a bad day and I'm no good at anything. Mm -hmm. So what I do in the martial arts school and with my own kids is when they're having a pity party, I'm like, hey, look at me. And they got to like look up. No, I said, look at me like you mean it. Like, look at me. Look with your whole body. Look at me. And then they have to look up. It raises the chest. It opens the body language. The next time you're feeling kind of depressed, kind of sad, roll your shoulders back, open up your chest, and take a deep breath with your belly. And your emotion starts to change because our body and our emotions are linked. So shoulders back, head up. But even just getting them to raise the chest a little bit, that's when I'll touch them. That's when I'll give them energy because I want to reinforce their resourcefulness, their strength versus play the victim now it's not a hundred percent sometimes i mean they're crying and they're sad and they just need to be cuddled sometimes i'm just going to do that because that's what they need too it's not a hard and fast rule okay and then the third thing i will tell you is feedback your communication when they say something to you say well here's what i'm hearing you say this do you mean or do you mean and and it helps me to funnel where the conversation is going but it helps me to make sure i'm getting what they're trying to tell me and I'm also training them how to start communicating with me because I may say something and what I say and what I mean are two different animals. The problem with little kids is they don't differentiate that. They only take what you say and that's all they have. They don't understand the implicit. They only understand the explicit. So because of that, I wanna be feeding information back because if I'm like, there's two ways I could take this, I'm gonna feed that back to them and over time, they begin to get exposed to that language track, that language pattern. They'll begin to feed stuff back to me. And I say, hey, could you do this? Well, do you mean, or do you want me to do, or do you want me to, and they can begin to sequence themselves better. What we're doing, sorry, I'm, I'm talking a little fast because when I get excited, I, I go a little fast. But what we're starting to do is we're starting to give them was a ladder to climb. We're giving them rungs to hold on to, to start building their skill and their ability. This is literally my favorite thing in the whole entire world, second to my family. Because when you guys start to understand how to ladder your kids, 
you begin to create people that can help you with your life and you're not micromanaging anymore. I was once talking with a friend of mine and she was like, oh, I love the stuff you're talking about, but I'm too busy to blah, 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 because my kids are blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait a minute, you have two boys that are teenagers and you're too busy wiping their butts for them to, well, no, I don't wipe their butts. Well, you just told me you cleaned up their mess and they peed all over the toilet and you cleaned it up. So literally you might not be wiping their butts, but metaphorically you keep fixing problems that they started. You just need to solve that. But I'm too busy. Are you? Are you? Or is it just easier to stay in the story of I'm too busy? Because you keep doing things for them and you keep driving yourself crazy versus teaching them to handle things for themselves. Hmm. We have the beginning of wisdom. So I'm Jeremy and I want to say thank you for tuning in today. I want to let you know you have the right to choose your own path and so do your kids. But sometimes they need some guidance. And that's what we're here to do as parents, to be guides and to be guardians. So let's remember those three tips. Number one, pay attention to the story and pay attention to the game. Number two, what am I reinforcing by giving it my attention and my energy and how much? And number three, watch that body language. Get them to open them up when they're getting closed off or they're getting stressed. And to just summarize the overall the conversation, I went through a lot of pain and a lot of stuff. And I didn't even go through the whole story because it's a lot longer. All of it, all the nitty gritty details, they don't matter so much as there's a way out of the pain. There's a way out of the struggle. And it really does fall into the stories we tell and the games that we play. And that's what we're going to work on together in this podcast. I'm going to have guests on. We're going to be talking about different strategies, different examples. A lot of my Kung Fu family is going to come in because they've got just literally decades and decades of experience teaching their own personal journeys, their own personal families. We want to give you some different models, different examples, and ways you can take new games into your life. And I want to say thank you. I want to tell you that you and your children are built to win the games you play. So let's play games worth winning. Let's play games where you get to feel good, I get to feel good at the same time. Because if we do that for each other in our families, we ripple it out into our communities, that's how we change the world. A lighted candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. So we got to light each other up. we got to make it a priority to put positive into each other as much as humanly possible. And then realize there's people who won't want to play win-win games with you and you can back out of their lives. You can create some distance. You can create some boundaries. And that's okay too. So thanks for joining me today. I am your host, Jeremy the Kung Fu Guy. This has been the Parenting Program Podcast. And I want to say thank you. And you can find me on social media. I am at Kung Fu Guy Jeremy on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube, as well as Jeremy Rodruck on Facebook and on Twitter. And those are the places to find me. And I have a cat that needs to go, and we need to go, and you guys have a great day. I'll see you later. Thanks again. Bye.